And uh, next we have Justin Wester from Cognine, and we're going to continue on this theme of wearables. So like Joel neglected to mention, there's going to be a huge secondary market for these for Daft Punk cover bands. <laughs> for the, the Beatles. So I'll be looking to pick up one before too long. So uh, my name is Justin Wester. I'm the CTO of Cognine, a mobile app development company here in town. Uh, and I'll be talking to you today, kind of a good segue from what Joel's been discussing here, wearable technologies. Uh, from an early age, I was very interested in wearable technology. The uh, watermark in the background is a Nintendo Power Club. Uh, some of you may have had this. It wasn't actually all that functional, but it was a lot of fun. <laughs> also referred to a Halloween costume. So uh, I'm going to talk about three key trends today. The first is wearable technology, uh, and specifically around mobile-worn sensors and displays. So right now, I'm wearing six displays six different displays on my body. I have some around my belt, one in front of my eye that's fairly obvious and somewhat socially awkward, I admit. Uh, then obviously I have my phone as well. So um, I want to talk about kind of what's going forward with these and why they're going to be interesting. And the first is finding more about yourself and what's going on inside your body. So um, what I have here on the screen was a mock-up of something that was actually officially announced last week. This is part of Apple's new health app. It'll be preloaded on all iPhones come this September. And what, is, what you're trying to get insight on here is, okay, if my blood pressure is spiking, uh, or if my blood sugar is too low or too high, I'm going to be unsafe. So in the context of an oil and gas setting, if I have workers who are doing dangerous jobs and I can get some intelligence about what's going on inside their bodies, maybe I can head off safety challenges in the past. So how are you actually going to get that intelligence about what's happening in people's bodies? Well, you're going to have wearable technology similar to this, or similar to what Joel was discussing in the Daft Punk Hub. So basically, these smartwatches will have all, will just be chock full of sensors. So things that can tell your blood oxygen levels, things that can take your heart rate. And so without you taking any direct action, you can actually get a lot of data about what's happening inside your body and again make those intelligent decisions. <coughs> and then the last trend that I want to talk here about in the wearable technology um, is this idea of contextual continuity. So if you're anything like me, which I think most people are not, but even if you're a standard technology user, how many devices are you interacting with in a given day? Probably at least two or three, maybe four, five, six, if you think about maybe your DDR in the morning, your laptop at your house, your desktop at the, at the office, uh, your phone in your pocket, your tablet. Every time you pick up a new device, you're kind of starting back at square one. There's really no continuity of I'm composing an email on my phone and I get in the elevator and now I'm in my office. Do I really want to keep pecking on my phone, or could I just use the keyboard that's in front of my monitor to really get the job done more efficiently? So the major platform providers like Apple and Google are actually making a lot of headway to allow you to pass information back and forth seamlessly. It's something that Apple's calling handoff. I'm not familiar with Google's name for it right now. Uh, but when it comes to productivity and efficiency, this is going to be a huge boom, really regardless of the industry. So the next trend I want to talk about is virtual reality, similar to what Joel was discussing. So, um, what we're really seeing within really the past 18 to 24 months is a re-emergence of virtual reality as being not just a niche thing that you see in a, a shopping mall to play a video game, but something that could have some actual business applicability. And really leading the charge was Oculus. They started as a Kickstarter project about two years ago. Uh, they went on to get a ton of VC funding, and obviously uh, we all know about the Facebook exit for just shy of $2 billion. So um, why would someone pay $2 billion for a virtual reality company? Well, they think that there's a lot of business applicability beyond just video games. Uh, we'll see what actually comes out of that. But if you're really wanting to become immersed in this virtual simulation, maybe you need something more than a goggle in front of your head. Maybe you need to pair that with some sort of motion. So what you see on the screen here is called the Virtuix Omni. It's a Houston success story if they actually bring the product to market. Hopefully within the next uh, 6 to 12 months they will. But basically it's a 360 degree treadmill. So you pair this with an Oculus Rift and you kind of strap into a harness and as you walk around in 3D space here, that actually tracks within the simulation. So now not only do you have your peripheral vision cut off, which in this context is a good thing, as you move through 3D space, it actually is a simulation of as if you were there. So what is the applicability of this? Well, think about that training that Joel was just, just discussing. The military has been using this sort of concept for a really long time and it's finally becoming affordable because of this high quality inexpensive hardware. And the last thing in the context of virtual reality that I want to talk about is hacking into your sense of self. Uh, what you see on the screen here is an image from the Stanford University uh, Human Virtual Interaction Lab. Uh, and if the Oculus Rift is kind of like the Cadillac Escalade of uh, virtual reality headsets, this is like a bit. 
Most people will never be able to afford to put one of these on. It goes upwards of $30,000 for that little rig that's on its head. So this is the highest of high quality. And it's so effective that the simulation that he's seeing right now, he's standing on a cliff, and the computer is going to simulate dropping out from under him, and his body is going to crumple to the ground because they have basically fooled his brain to thinking he's in imminent body risk. So why is that interesting? Well, up at the top of the slide, you notice I talk about being a virtual first workforce. So if you think about what most of you do today in your jobs, if you're in the marketing realm or the social media realm, you're probably interfacing with computers most of the time. You're pecking a keyboard, using a mouse, maybe doing conference calls, and that's your primary mode of existence. I think 25 years ago, what were you doing or what were office workers doing? They were having in-face conversations, they were probably filling out TPS reports with pens and actual paper, uh, they were doing conference calls, some things never changed. Um, but fast forward about five to 10 years into the future, we won't be digital first, we'll be virtual first. We'll be strapping on these helmets, doesn't matter if I'm a slob and just my boxer shorts, my avatar of myself will look like I'm George Clooney from Us the Air. So really, this sense of self and the sense of body identity will change in a lot of ways, and that will open up some really interesting opportunities. Now, the last trend that I want to talk about um, is the notion of the smartphone, instead of being jettisoned in favor of new technologies like Google Glass or smartwatches, is really becoming entrenched, is becoming that true hub of your digital life. And why is that interesting? Well, the smartphone technology has evolved so rapidly within the past 10 years. Think about what phone you were using 10 years ago. Honestly, does it look anything like the one in your pocket today? Nothing like it, right? It was probably a little Nokia thing, a candy bar phone. It probably looked more like this clicker in my hand than an iPhone or an Android device. So if you look forward into the future, what does that mean in terms of our capabilities? So MIMS, MEMS, is microelectromagnetic systems. Basically, these are sensors, these are devices, be anything from video game console to a pressure sensor in this body-worn suit. All this information is not getting passed directly back to the internet. Where is it going? It's going to your smartphone. That smartphone becomes basically the uplink into the cloud. And so this is only accelerating to the point where now anything can be smart. All you have to do is put a Bluetooth low-energy radio in it, so everything from your car key to the thermostat to your remote control, all of these things can communicate back to your smartphone, and they go up to the internet. So inherently, that makes them intelligent. So beyond just this um, smartphone being the center of your universe, I, I'm kind of stretching here on this next slide, but I wanted to talk about drones, because drones are cool, right? And why are drones applicable in the energy industry? Did anyone see a report yesterday of BP getting the first commercial drone contract in the US? Yeah. So they're going to be flying over Alaska looking um, basically in kind of a reconnaissance role, uh, similar to what the military has been doing for a number of years. My, my brother is actually a drone pilot for the Air Force. They call them RPAs, Remotely Piloted Aircrafts. Uh, he flies uh, what's called the Reaper, so he can never tell me exactly what he's doing on any given day, and I don't know where in the world he's actually remotely piloting this aircraft. But every time we get together around the holidays, we talk about kind of what's next, and what's the applicability of this technology. And so what he, when he visited me over Memorial Day weekend, was talking about, he's really bullish on the application of this in the energy sector. Because if you think going into really dangerous or remote areas, if you have to inspect the pipeline, but right away you have to dispatch someone out there to actually look at this physically. If you could reduce the risk and just send a quadcopter out there, think of all the safety mishaps you could potentially prevent. So that's pretty interesting stuff. So I'll end with this quote. Uh, you may have heard it before. I use the analogy of thinking back to your smartphone using it 2004, um, but then do kind of a shorter term look back. What were you using what, two years ago? So in 2012, it was probably a lot more similar to what you're using today. So you don't evolve all that much in two years. But you sure as heck do within a decade. So keep that in mind and make sure you're ready for it. And with that, I think we segue to yeah. Q&A time. We are ready for questions. Any questions for the panel? 